I'm here with Tanya Yajnik, my teaching assistant this fall for public health entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. Tanya is a student in, in the Masters of Public Health program at the Yale School of Public Health. She took this course last fall and then took my Introduction to Social Entrepreneurship course in the spring, formed a venture that she came back and shared with my students today. Thank you so much, Tanya. I know you just got off presenting your <laughs> venture twice in a row to both sections. How are you feeling? I'm great. I uh, really enjoyed hearing all of their thoughts and getting the chance to share. Okay, so tell us about, we in my spring class, we start with a problem, right? And we form a team around a social challenge that this team wants to tackle. So tell mm -hmm. us, what is the social challenge that brought your team together? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, on the first day of your spring class, I met a few other students who were really interested in mental health. And um, in particular, we wanted to figure out how that was important for university students. And um, we formed a team. We started to try to understand better what are the challenges that students face in terms of anxiety or depression um, or just really not feeling well on campus. And at first we thought, you know, maybe we would be really um, trying to get out in the community. We would go to the middle schools in New Haven and we would try to work with middle school students. We knew there was a lot of research around PTSD and uh, students of color. Mm. But very quickly, um, we read this heropreneurship article that we discussed in class as well. And the fact that doing social entrepreneurship work is really not about trying to be the hero and trying to just um, make good because you want to be at the center of it, but rather to do things that you understand and to be involved in ways that incorporate a team and really understanding a problem that you've lived with. And so, and that's the Tackling yep. Heropreneurship Report by Daniela Pappy Thornton, which says, you know, don't try to be the hero and swoop in and save someone, but rather mm -hmm. think about what are the social problems that you have faced and dealt with in your life and how can you mobilize resources to tackle them, which exactly. is exactly what you did. Yeah, it was great. We um, got into the university space here at Yale. Um, it's an it's a university and a community that we've all lived in and that we've either experienced mental health challenges or we've helped um, students with mental health challenges in a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. And so we felt very comfortable in that space and even then realized how much we had to learn. So tell us a little bit about where you landed. You're launching this month. Yes. So what is the final product that you ended up creating and what were the main surprises along the way? Yeah, it's been such a ride and so much of iteration. Um, I look back at our earliest wireframes and our earliest work, and I <laughs> can't even imagine that it was in the same year. I remember year. grading those. <laughs> I know. <laughs> did you did you know you were going to launch a real venture? Or were, you were just taking a class? We were taking a class, but I think um, I was very passionate about this topic. And I think very early on in the spring course, it became clear to me that this was something that really mattered and something I wanted to work on. And I was just lucky to have people in my team who cared about it too. And you and I both continued after the class. Okay, so what's the product and how did you get there? Yeah, so basically it's an app. Um, it is to help connect students to the good life. And we talk about good life being, you know, happy, fun, exciting events. But from the back uh, part that we do as the team, um, it's really about thinking about wellness, thinking about social determinants of health that we study in public health, and making sure that the events and resources we're providing these students with can actually help with their individual mental health needs. And you initially started off thinking that it would be something that links students to mental health services, right? right? And bridges the gap between the university mental health services and the students who want to access them. So how did you get to this instead? Yeah, um, I think with the resources on campus, we definitely, um, you know, early on thought about trying to integrate with clinical care on campus. And we realized very quickly that we didn't want to remake the wheel. There was already clinical care. There was already hospital care. But what we could do was aggr aggregate the resources in the community to really help students know where to start. Um, and we focused a lot on not just the resources, but the events in real time that they offer, because we wanted the app to be dynamic so that students keep coming back and seeing in real time what are new experiences and events on campus that I could use um, and could make me feel better. So how did your own personal background and journey fit into this? You're a trained psychiatrist, right? 
So I went to medical school in West Texas. Um, my focus was in uh, clinical psychiatry. I did my uh, final year rotations, my fifth year of uh, medical school in Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, and California. And, um, you know, I think one thing that played a huge role in my interest was the fact that I also study music. Um, I'm a uh, a student and a musician of classical um, concert piano and opera, and was very interested in sort of this blend and this combination of music and mental health. And I just had this intuitive feeling, this gut sense that there was some underlying mechanism that related them and that music could be helpful for mental health, but I just didn't really know what it was. But Unto there's a lot of science backing that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of science for the neurological side. Mm -hmm. So when you think about autism or you think about Williams syndrome, the research is becoming more and more clear. But for mental health and psychology, it's less of a clear space. Mm. Also because we don't really have in a working definition for emotion in psychology. Mm. And so much of music work is around emotion in the limbic system. Um, so one way that I found a very strong connection that I was interested in was uh, with yoga and with meditative practices. A lot of artists use meditation in their performance work, and it really helps them to approach the music and also to feel less stressed during performance. And I started to apply those similar yoga techniques uh, to mental health and learned about John Kabat-Zinn, Mark Epstein, and other psychoanalysts who were doing this sort of cross-sectional work. You also mentioned in class a book called The Second Mountain by David Brooks. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I love that book and the concept. Um, he talks in the beginning about this first mountain, and it's very sort of reminiscent of your 20s and 30s where you're just trying to like accomplish things and get up the mountain. Um, and sometimes maybe it can even feel like a rat race and that people are just trying to get there first, you know? Um, but he talks about how over time, you really look for something more that's not enough. And maybe there's the second mountain and this space of connection and of giving and being more meaningfully connected to your community. And I almost take that first mountain and I inverse it and I make it more into like a Mariana Trench. And I think about how it goes sort of deep inside yourself and thinking more about can you walk deeper into yourself and think about what is it that I'm so passionate about and the place where I can really give in my own unique way. So is your hope that this app, can an app actually help someone do that? It sounds very higher level and spiritual. So how can an app help you do that? I think um, in just Or a, are these students yeah. still climbing the first mountain and maybe not ready for the second one? So I think a lot of this philosophy is important for the why of like why we're making the app. Mm -hmm. But for the student, they don't have to go through so many philosophical levels. I think for them, it should just be an app that meets them where they are and helps them connect to the good life by giving them sort of fun, exciting, happy experiences. And then we do more of the work mm -hmm. trying to make sure that the events and the resources that we're su suggesting actually meet their needs. So now you're going to graduate this spring. And so what's what do you think will happen? Will you go back to clinical work? Will you take this on full time as CEO? What's the plan? So I decided um, and made the bold gesture to not continue to residency. Um, I think going into that second mountain, it was really a place where I knew that music performance and this sort of innovation work was so important to me. Um, and that mental health was something that I could really help with in this unique way. So I've, I'm kind of of the idea that, you know, you make the next right decision and that makes the next right decision and build one solid um, step at a time. And so I'm just so excited for our launch and then to see what happens next. Okay. And that's great advice, I think, for innovators and entrepreneurs in general. You mm -hmm. don't have to have the full picture. You have to have the full picture of the why, like mm -hmm. you said, what's motivating this, what is the theory of change and the underlying assumptions. But then in terms of how you're going to do it and what will be the outcome, mm -hmm. you just have to take it one step at a time. And one thing your team did really well was get so much feedback each step of the way. So advice I would give to other students, I remember in my spring class when I told people talk to as many people as you can, some teams talked to 5, 10, 20 people, but your team talked to 200 people. 
including undergrads, graduate students, deans, mental health providers, healthcare insurance, uh, so many others. And so I think that that is how iteration and co-creation happens. It's not that you say, okay, now I'm going to iterate, now I'm going to co-create. It's just that you're going to talk to end users and other stakeholders and get their feedback, and that forces you to take things one step at a time in a cyclical, not linear way, so that you are iterating and co-creating. Exactly, and I think um, keeping that sort of ideation process going all the time is actually super nourishing and really fulfilling and kind of keeps you from getting too stressed out about other aspects that are not always so easy. And that's how you keep learning and you keep innovating. You have to mm-hmm. build a learning organization, not just a product. Exactly. So any other closing thoughts or advice for students who want to innovate, whether it's building a new venture or innovating within an existing institution? I think for students who are excited to work with entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, I think my first thing is just welcome. And it's really exciting to always have new ideas, new people, different perspectives. And that's what makes for a really interesting and exciting workspace. Um, In terms of advice, I think not being afraid to reach out for help is so important because you don't always have all the answers and that's okay. You're not supposed to have all the answers and there are mentors and supporters who maybe won't know everything that you're trying to do, but they can help with one piece of it. And when you put all those pieces together, it makes a whole. Thank you so much, Tanya, for taking both courses, TAing one or maybe both courses, and coming back to share your work with other students. And more importantly, just helping to build this community of ambitious innovators and people who are daring greatly in public health entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you.